All right, I think we are about ready to begin. I want to say good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast. I want to thank everybody who's attending uh, our latest lecture in the Nimble uh, webinar series. Today we're looking at blockchain integration and SAP. Uh, a little bit about us, we are uh, SAP technologists at Nimble and SAP ecosystem thought leaders. Uh, we have a consulting business which is 50% of our work which delivers SAP projects both technical and functional while our Denver-based SAP Managed Services, the other 50% supports uh, both the Fortune 1000 and Mid-Market 24-7. Here are a list of some of the services that we currently offer. And uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, we want to be able to answer as many questions as possible. So if you take a look at the chat box in the lower left-hand corner, uh, feel free to type in any questions and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, one additional note, everybody will be receiving a fully edited copy of the presentation. So if you miss a slide uh, or have to step away for a moment, don't worry, uh, you will be uh, sent the full video. So let's get started. A little bit about our presenter. Our speaker today is Michael Pytel. Michael Pytel is a certified uh, SAP NetWeaver, HANA, and SoulMan resource, uh, 10 years of technical experience with 13 years of overall ERP experience. He is the author of SAP Press's Implementing SAP Business Suite on SAP HANA, a nationally recognized speaker uh, having recently presented on blockchain at the 2017 FIT uh, Innovation Exchange. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Mike, go ahead and take it away. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake. So, you know, today's webinar is is um, a topic that it, it, traditionally we haven't we, we you know traditionally Nimble kind of covers uh, topics within the SAP community that you all already own, and today's topic is is about emerging technologies and uh, what we want to talk about is the the blockchain as a technology as a distributed database and really try to help people understand how is this going to impact the SAP community and, and potentially what are the asks going to be from industry associations, trade associations, regulatory agencies, what is their ask going to be when it comes to blockchain? You know, is there going to be a re regulatory requirement for a distributed database for food traceability or for pharmaceuticals or anything that's FDA validated? or um, or within the supply chain wanting to add more value. And so today's, today's session is, is definitely a little bit more forward thinking. Uh, it is a little bit theoretical. We'll go through an explainer on uh, sort of the blockchain community as it stands today, uh, go through and, and I'll cover a little bit about uh, the currency markets within blockchain. But really I'm going to focus on blockchain as a distributed database and, and, and where SAP is providing uh, the opportunity to integrate with blockchain from your traditional on-premise SAP systems. Now, some of you may have heard this term before, Industry 4.0. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a phrase that has been coined by a trade association in Germany. And essentially, Germany being one of the manufacturing leaders in the world, uh, is well on its way in terms of the IoT and integration of uh, sensors and devices and shop floor automation uh, as for, throughout the manufacturing process. Um, Germany as, an organ, as a country has outlined some standards for Industry 4.0, and essentially, the goal is to further integrate uh, vendors and suppliers and manufacturers together so that information exchange happens more freely. So beyond just vendor consigned inventory, but actually at the machine level, at the plant level, at the maintenance level, integrating suppliers and vendors and customers and manufacturers together so that we're all able to operate more efficiently and, and sort of the ultimate goal here is that it's mutually beneficial for everybody that participates. And that's, to me, that is the underlying theme of an organization that participates in a blockchain database is that, you know, you're going to have one uh, camp, which is uh, we're going to participate in this blockchain database because a regulatory agency is forcing us to, right? We have to comply with this regulation. But then there's the other uh, side of the coin, which will be um, organizations that, are, that, that that want to increase transparency and visibility with their customers and, and suppliers. And it's mutually beneficial for all parties, meaning it's either bottom line cost reductions or top line revenue increases by sharing more information and working more efficiently with our trading partners. So Bern, Bern Lukert just recently posted this, this uh, blog out on SAP. I think that it is, uh, it is a good read. I've cited our source here. You can, when you have the presentation, you have to click on that and, and read, read his, his article there. Very good, very good article. 
Now, obviously, we all know about blockchains as a, as a cryptocurrency, and specifically, you know, right now, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, you know, my screenshot in the back, I wish I would have bought it 3000 at $3,800 because uh, blockchain passed $5,000 uh, yesterday. So had I had I bought some Bitcoin in September 20th when I when I took that screenshot, uh, I would already be up $1,200. Anyways, uh, cryptocurrencies began in 2009. Uh, we believe, or the internet has cited, because uh, everything's true on the internet, that uh, a group of programmers under the name Satoshi Nakamoto sort of sort of created this, this the the concept of a blockchain database in Bitcoin. Ultimately, it's a, it's a cryptocurrency um, that is mined, right? So there's a finite mi- uh, amount of, of currency that will exist within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Ethereum is a little bit different. Ethereum as well is a growing cryptocurrency. Um, and the main thing you need to understand here is that it's a decentralized distributed database where transactions are peer-to-peer. That does not mean, that does not mean though, that all blockchain databases are distributed, decentralized, and peer-to-peer. We have semi-private database, blockchain databases. We have private blockchains. We have multiple types of blockchain databases, and really that's what we're here to talk about. Now, in terms of the ecosystem of, of blockchain in the, in the financial tech, you know, I have a screenshot here that I cite my source there at the bottom, and ultimately it's just a highlight to everybody within the SAP community that there's this whole other financial tech community within the Bitcoin world, within the, the cryptocurrency world, that exists. We have crypto hedge funds, right, hedge funds that – are dealing in, 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 in cryptocurrency. We have VCs and organizations doing what are called initial coin offerings to launch their business, right? So rather than going to Silicon Valley and raising money, they are creating initial coin offerings or having ICOs to, to fund startups and, and new businesses. Um, as I said before, you know, Bitcoin is, a, is, a, is an object. It's a tangible object that can be stored, right? You have Bitcoin storage companies uh, where you can put where you need to store something. And a funny story there, uh, we have a nimble uh, colleague here who, who, who mined a Bitcoin probably two years ago. Uh, he knows it's worth a lot of money, but he can't find the hard drive that it was on. So um, it's, uh, uh, you know, he's definitely you know, w- wishing that he could find that hard drive. So there's this whole financial ecosystem, and, and absolutely SAP will be integrating into this ecosystem, be able to integrate payment uh, programs, integ- integrate cross-border, cross-country payments, uh, through cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, so definitely this, this ecosystem will continue to thrive and continue to exist. Uh, but again, I'm going to focus more on the supply chain side of the house today. Um, more backstory for you. Uh, there is a, a, there's a consortium uh, of, of companies called the Hyperledger Consortium, which essentially is a group of organizations that are, are developing their own, uh, their own blockchain database technologies. And there's seven different projects within the Hyperledger ecosystem. Uh, The initial contributors were Intel and IBM, so uh, there's already some powerhouses there. Um, Then we had Accenture and NTT join, and then naturally uh, SAP, uh, Amex, right from a financial perspective, and then SAP joined recently. And when I talk about joining this consortium, it's not just sort of, here's my logo, put it on your website, right? Joining this consortium meant that SAP, you know, essentially had to contribute $250,000 to this consortium. So it wasn't a small chunk of change that they, that they had to contribute to join this consortium. So there's a lot of press about Leonardo. There's a lot of press about SAP's blockchain database as a service. And as, as of recently, as of this morning, you and I as SAP customers still cannot buy blockchain database as a service from SAP. It's not available on the cloud platform trial. There is no help documentation. You know, I, uh, there, additional details were expected at, at TechEd. We did get more. But SAP's blockchain database as a service is still in its very infancy. In fact, right now it's an invite-only program for customers to participate in. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that their solution will be the best or that their solution is the only solution that you can use. And what I'm going to talk about as we continue is, there are a lot of different blockchain technologies that we can think about uh, out there, right? It's still the Wild West. So one of the ones that I think is, is leading the charge in terms of uh, uh, corporations participating in blockchain or deploying blockchain databases, uh, the first one to, of note is Ethereum. So Ethereum is also a cryptocurrency, uh, but it is also a distributed database. And ultimately, Ethereum has, the, uh, has uh, employed the concept of smart contracts, 
So the ability to issue contracts for service or products uh, into a blockchain database and then having vendors, suppliers, customers also participate in that, that distributed blockchain database and accept contracts, uh, uh, you know, notify delivery of service, delivery of goods, notify of pay, uh, invoices and payments. And so Ethereum is sort of leading the charge there. And that's, that's one of the ones that, that I have personally installed and deployed and connected to SAP. Uh, the next database I want to talk about, which was very interesting to me, is that JP Morgan is in the database game, right? Um, I didn't think of, I think I, obviously we know that banks would support sort of a consortium uh, of databases, uh, but, but, but JP Morgan is, uh, has their own uh, distributed database called Quorum based on Ethereum. Uh, it is definitely tailored to financial transactions, cross-border payments, cross-border, uh, cross-border payments, cross-border uh, transactions. Um, it is private and it is permissioned with a known participant. So if you go back to Bitcoin as a currency, the participants are anonymous, right? Um, nobody knows who you don't, the, uh, I'm anonymous in that Bitcoin community. Nobody knows that I own three or four or five Bitcoins, right? It's anonymous. Quorum it's a set of known participants, and so there can be permission, and, and these permissions can extend to contracts. Uh, certain vendors can see certain types of contracts, and other vendors can see other types of contracts. So it's important to know that as a database, as a distributed database, blockchain database, Quorum, allows you to have permissioned groups of participants. The next one I think you need to know about is BigchainDB. BigChain can be private or public, uh, a, a distributed database. Uh, what's interesting about this is it's completely linear in terms of growth and scaling, meaning the more nodes, uh, uh, more big chain DB nodes that you have within this environment, the bigger it grows. So it's 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 more of a, a more of a distributed database that that uh, you know IT departments that are comfortable working with from a database perspective. Uh, it's distributed, it's high performance. Um, yeah, ultimately, Big Chain DB has a has a has a has a great set of backers as an organization. I think you're going to see this this organization continue to grow. Um, Gartner's got a few write ups on them, and and you'll see that. Uh, Microsoft and IBM, uh, you know, and Amazon, etc. You know, I didn't list Amazon on the slide, um, but Azure, obviously, in the in the blockchain blockchain game, uh, it's Ethereum blockchain as a service. IBM's blockchain based on Hyperledger, also available as a service only. So. These organizations, obviously, there's a market-driven uh, strategy, or at least the markets are asking these soft, big software companies to have sort of software as a service as an additional revenue stream. So for Microsoft and IBM, you know, who traditionally make databases that you and I can install on our servers and our laptops and our data center, uh, Microsoft and IBM have adopted the blockchain as a service-only model uh, where it will require a subscription. Again, there's, uh, there's, there's hundreds of blockchain databases out there. I've tried to synthesize what I think are the leaders uh, today as it relates to using a blockchain database uh, for integration with SAP. In terms, uh, blockchain terms, right? So uh, you're gonna read, you're gonna, whenever you're, you, you all are writing, or, or, or I'm sorry, reading or researching blockchain, you're gonna see a lot of these different terms here. Cryptographic guarantees, uh, essentially all transactions are signed. Right, cryptographically and verifiable. So even though I may be anonymous, I have, I'm cryptographically signing a transaction uh, and it is guaranteed and then the authenticity of that transaction is validated against multiple nodes in the blockchain distributed database. In terms of pseudonymity, this is uh, available typically in the, in the public blockchain database world where uh, I want to rename uh, anonymous. Uh, immutability, uh, I think that's a cool word. I uh, never really used that word before blockchain. But ultimately, the idea here behind immutability is that uh, the, the blockchain is a, is a system of record, right? If you think about CFR Part 11 requirements, um, a, a record in the, in the blockchain can neither be destroyed or archived, right? It's permanently written to the blockchain, accessible and viewable by all that have permission to read that transaction. Um, once confirmed, the transaction cannot be changed. Uh, and in the, in the case of Ethereum and smart contracts, you can understand how this is uh, a wonderful capability because uh, if I write a contract into the database and somebody accepts that contract, it is uh, validated across multiple nodes and verified so that there is a, a documented agreement between me and a supplier or sub-vendor, right? And then distributed ownership. So in terms of public blockchains, you know, no one owns the blockchain. Um, anybody can add to the ledger and everybody validates. In a consortium blockchain, think of like a blockchain that the FDA might, might, might ask 
uh, all you know level two validation customers or, or manufacturers to participate in. Um, uh, they participate in the blockchain equally, uh, and and a certain number of votes is required to authenticate transactions in the blockchain. Right, so uh, the, there are different varying levels, the, the different types of blockchain databases, and so again, just continuing the education path. Um, so far, you know, we've learned that it's more than currency. Uh, there are multiple database vendors available in the marketplace today. There are data, blockchain databases you can install on your own uh, on, an, on an operating system in your data center. There are blockchain databases that are available as a service uh, that you can subscribe to, um, and blockchain databases can be permissioned, right? It, not all blockchain databases are public, right? They can be private or semi-private, permissioned with varying group, varying group uh, participation. Moving on, you know, there's a video here that's in the, uh, in the, in the, in the presentation that you all are going to be able to play, uh, and it's a three or, four, five, three or four minute video that you guys are going to be able to play. We're going to go ahead and skip that, and I'm just going to go through some of the automation, uh, the, the animations. If we take an example of uh, commercial, fish, fish, uh, commercial fishing, uh, one statistic that I'm sure you've all read in the, in the journal or USA Today is that 30% of all fish consumed in the United States is mislabeled. And up to 40% of the fish consumed in the marketplace is, is from illegal fishing or hatcheries. Right? So we have a marketplace where the consumer is potentially – eating fish that is not the fish that they intended on purchasing or fish that is not properly handled. And now we have multiple participants in this community, right? We have the commercial fisherman who's out there fishing. We have uh, the distributor, the wholesale processor of, uh, of the fish who is purchasing the fish from the fisherman and giving it maybe to a secondary processor or to a distributor who is then in turn selling it to a restaurant. So at the end of the day, how does the restaurateur know that the – black cod that I purchased is in fact black cod and that it was sustainably raised or sustainably caught and where it was, where it was uh, fished from, uh, how was it stored, where was it stored, was it stored at the proper temperature, etc. So in terms of um, participating in this blockchain, you can kind of understand or start to see it is in everybody's best interest to participate in this blockchain. The fisherman wants everybody to know that they're following the laws and the regulations in, in catching fish and storing the fish while on their boat. The distributor and the processor of the fish wants, wants the buyer to know that they are, have the highest quality fish. It's been stored at the proper temperature. It is correctly labeled. It was not mishandled or, or placed into a different batch. And then that the distributor was able to process it efficiently in terms of distribution to the restaurant. So where does blockchain come in, right? You could, as an example, have sensors attached to a batch or a, or a, a container of fish uh, that is caught, and then as it moves through the different supply chain, uh, it is continually monitored, and each participant in the supply chain is, is continuing to send that data to a distributed blockchain database. The, the fisherman is sending data about location, where did I catch the fish, the temperature at which I'm storing it. The wholesale distributor of the fish is storing the, the type of fish, when it was received, and when it was given to a distributor. Distributor is then storing you know, at what temperature was it, was, it, uh, was, it re was it received, at what temperature was it delivered to the restaurant. And ultimately, the guy on the right, uh, as you'll see in the video when you have time to watch it, is the restaurateur who has a clear traceability into the supply chain to say, I know that I'm getting a high-quality fish from a specific location. It was stored and handled in a, in a, in a proper manner. This obviously uh, is, is, is helpful to everybody in the supply chain, including the restaurateur who's selling that fish. So again, Within the distributed blockchain database, we have the ability to store a lot of this data. We have the ability to store location, temperature, humidity, uh, the motion, the transportation, the duration, etc. All part of that distributed database and all shared between all parties. Just one example, you know, not all examples within the blockchain world or use cases are fish related, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But, but, the, but the, uh, the main point here is is do, if you need to understand blockchain uh, technology uh, a little bit better outside of cryptocurrency, uh, do, do watch that video when you receive the presentation because it, uh, it, it is a great explainer and it's, it's, it's within four or five minutes. So taking a step back, let's look at where we are today in terms of in the SAP ecosystem, whether I'm ERP or S4, how am I integrating into uh, – how am I integrating with my customers? How am I integrating with my partners? 
So today on the right, you see I have S4 and I might have SAP PI in my landscape or SAP PO. Or if I've been, uh, you know, so we're, if I'm early in the adoption curve, I might be using SAP Cloud Platform integration services. And then I'm integrating with my business partners and, and customers through their integration platform to their backend data system. Um, you know, the, co the complaint here within organizations is typically the time it takes to onboard and offboard your trading partners. Um, if you're not using standard EDI document types, this is the process where, as an example, we have a customer that's a pie company, and when they wanted to, um, uh, uh, they would have a pie company that is a, a trading partner with Walmart, and Walmart says, in order to do business with us, we must use, um, we must integrate electronically through EDI, and they go through a mapping exercise, and, and you know, they onboard each other. So you know, it's a it's a one to one scenario. Typically, every integration is a little bit different. Not in, you know, we do as much as we can to templatize. Um, we do have security standardization today, right? We 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 are using encrypted payloads. We have user password. Um, if you're if you're doing things correctly today, you're more than likely using certificate based authentication as well, um, where you're sharing public keys between you and your trading partner and using specific authentication. Um, Edifact, ANSI, EDIX, TMACS, these are all EDI standards that are available in the marketplace and you're using those. So this is a good idea of where we're at today. Now if you think about this again, it's a hub and spoke model where you're at the center of this hub and your partners are connecting to you and you may have a connection to an EDI van, sort of a value added network, um, like a Sterling Commerce or a Gentran or uh, things like that, right? We see a vans a lot in the, uh, in the uh, uh, retail space, we see vans a lot in, in consumer goods in terms of shoe manufacturing, clothing manufacturing, etc. But it's a hub and spoke model, right? If your instance goes down, uh, the different partners in the network cannot trade. As an example, Nimble has a customer that is a shoe manufacturer. Uh, they have EDI integration to their subcontract manufacturer. When that subcontract manufacturer processes or builds those shoes, they send a confirmation to the, uh, to the designer. The, our, a Nimble's customer, that, that Nimble's customer then sends an EDI document to uh, back to that subcomp manufacturer saying, hey, please drop this, drop ship this, this order to our 3PL distributor. So the third-party logistics provider uh, then gets an EDI document from our customer saying, hey, you're going to receive these shoes from here. Here are the sales orders that they go to, distribute to Nordstrom, distribute to the Nike store, distribute here and there, et cetera. So in that model, you can see how in the hub and spoke model, if, if my organization's internet connectivity goes down, my SAP PI platform goes down, uh, or if it's inaccessible, or I introduced a change into PI that takes that interface down, no one is communicating, right? My, my subcontract manufacturer could still be producing, and they're not able to communicate to the 3PL provider because they're pivoting through me as an organization. Going to a distributed private blockchain database, all of my trading partners now have the ability to participate in a private blockchain where now me as an organization, I've permissioned my suppliers and my third-party third logistics providers to be able to read when a production order or a, a production order is ready and confirmed and when it's ready to ship, where is it shipping to, and then writing to the blockchain database for my third-party logistics providers what order, what shoes go to what partner, uh, go to what retailer, etc. Right, sort of the decentralized model. And in the middle of this is SAP's cloud platform integration services. This assumes that I may be running my own private blockchain database in Azure or IBM, or I'm hosting it myself in Amazon, and it's my own uh, d distributed database. Um, I could host it on my own in multiple continents to keep it safe and secure using Amazon's infrastructure, or I could push some responsibility into my partners to host copies of the blockchain database themselves. If we think about that out loud, you know, we have partners now having an IT infrastructure requirement to host these distributed blockchain databases, uh, which increases their cost of doing business. So these are all things that we have to, to have to weigh, but ultimately you can see the value here, right? We have a decentralized database. It's highly resilient multiple participants, validating, signing transactions, it's cryptographic will be secure, it's the immutable records that we've talked about, one of the benefits of blockchain. It's shared read-write, it's high-performing, and if any node in the network is unavailable or down, the activities can continue, right? right? 
the activities can continue. So uh, again, the shared model where with the hub and spoke, if I'm unavailable, then my third-party logistics provider and my subcontract manufacturer, they're not able to communicate with each other. In this distributed model, I have a blockchain database supporting communication across the board. Let's take a hypothetical model. Now, I have a, a, a friend of mine who, um, in the year 1999, I was an AS400 operator, and he was a senior RPG programmer, and we were working on a Y2K project, remediating RPG code in the AS400 for Y2K. Uh, since then, uh, that individual has now become the CEO of a company called Middleby Marshall. So from RPG developer to, to CEO of a company that makes pizza ovens. Uh, fantastic company. Uh, several hundred million dollar organization, and uh, pretty innovative, uh, pretty innovative CEO. In that, uh, sales have increased in EMEA in, in Asia and India, uh, well over 40 percent. And and when talking to my friend, uh, his name is Partha Biswas, by the way. When talking to Partha, I I wanted to understand Partha. You know, how did you became CEO of a pizza oven company? How were you able to grow so fast in these markets? Uh, was it product growth, meaning Pizza Hut and Papa John's were growing so strong that, uh, that they needed more pizza ovens? And ultimately what he said is that the marketplace for pizza ovens was, was pretty equal in those markets, and the way that he, he beat his competition was by deploying IoT sensors in the pizza ovens to detect faults, and essentially cellular cards on those pizza ovens then phoned home, and then Middleby won on the service game. They won on customer service. So they were sending out technicians to service pizza ovens to keep those pizza ovens running more quickly. Now, if we think out loud and just pretend for a little bit, you can begin to kind of see how would a blockchain database enable or further enable Middleby Marshall to continue to grow their operations. We could potentially have a distributed blockchain database where instead of Middleby Marshall being the hub and spoke model of distributing service orders uh, and distributing parts and, and information to its dealer network and its service providers and its customer network, we could begin having these pizza ovens write their data uh, to a distributed blockchain database when Middleby Marshall detects a changes in temperature or sensors or faults in those equipment. They could begin writing service orders uh, to the distributed uh, blockchain database. The service providers would then pick up those service orders, so it's sort of a first come, first serve, first in, first out, a model where we have uh, predefined contracts and agreements with uh, service providers. They're able to pick up those contracts and, and service those, and then all while keeping the dealer network involved, knowing that, hey, I have a customer that has a pizza oven down. They reported this problem. This service provider is going out to fix it. Uh, thereby, the dealer network is able to stay informed and have a better relationship with a customer. So again, Middleby Marshall, a really cool company, doesn't run uh, SAP. Uh, uh, I, I brought them up because, again, uh, it was a, a friend of mine that is the CEO and deployed these sort of sensors and devices. And I think in this scenario, uh, in terms of uh, uh, servicing uh, assets in a field, uh, this is a great use case for a distributed blockchain database. Uh, we have sensor data. We have service agreements. We have customers, dealers, vendors, manufacturers, all communicating uh, on a global scale in multiple countries um, in, in essentially trying to provide the highest level of service to their customers. And it's mutually beneficial for all those engaged. Now, Nimble being based in Denver, we obviously have to talk about marijuana as a product. And within the, uh, within the, Colorado, within the state of Colorado, uh, marijuana is tracked from what's called seed to sale. So when a marijuana plant is planted within a, a licensed growing operation, as soon as the plant reaches a certain height of, uh, I believe, six inches tall, it is immediately tagged with an RFID tag. Uh, so that plant is assigned an RFID tag, and that RFID is then reported to a central authority here to the governing agency within the state of Colorado. So that plant is then tracked uh, from, 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 from six inches tall to harvest, the RFID DAG is then associated to the harvest. If that harvest then goes into uh, sort of a, toba a smoking tobacco type product, it is tracked. If it goes into uh, pancake mix or syrups or any of your tiger balms uh, to rub on your, your shoulder wounds, the, the product has traceability from seed to sale. Uh, today, this process within the state of Colorado is Excel-based. Uh, the uh, state of Colorado has a website that uh, vendors and distributors continually complain about in terms of latency and performance and the system crashing and going down. Uh, 
Now, again, thinking about what we've learned so far, is this a use case for a distributed database? Could a regulatory agency be better served in having a more online, real-time database distributed between the state and its licensed operators who, where everybody is now accurately reporting in real time their inventory, their on-hand, their on-hand inventory, their sales, so that the state of Colorado would have better, would have be more effective at, at operating a recall if it, was, if it had to, right? If there was a problem with a product or a certain market or a certain store, how quickly could both the store operator and the state of Colorado act on that information? A distributed database uh, would mean that, that it would uh, simplify the reporting of the data. The state of Colorado would have better access to the data. And again, it, it, I think it would be mutually beneficial. So in this example, we have a regulatory agency, uh, the marijuana industry in Colorado, and operating uh, sort of a shared distributed database using blockchain. Naturally, everybody here uh, would know that, that, that blockchain absolutely makes sense when it comes to electronic medical records, right? Having um, a consortium or a group of hospitals or even um, the Department of Health uh, operating a blockchain database where all insurance operators, providers, and participants uh, patients participating in, in a sort of a distributed blockchain database that is private, that is permissioned, that is secure, and one that enables communication of data more effectively to the people that need it most. Uh, we could also, you know, if you begin thinking about patient-generated data, uh, so the health apps on your phone, your Fitbit, and uh, your Garmin devices, being able to, sh to, to begin sharing that information to a distributed blockchain, uh, your doctor and medical professionals having access to that information, uh, so better long-term planning, better analysis, and as you change doctors or move states and change uh, jobs or change cities and locations, everybody has access to the same data. But most importantly, it would be permissioned. And ideally in this scenario, uh, if this ever comes to fruition, uh, we the consumers would have the ability to permission this. So uh, we would have essentially some way of permissioning uh, certain doctors and providers and seeing that data and sharing it with them. So a wonderful example of, of a potential use case for blockchain uh, in the future, I think. Um, in terms of building applications for blockchain, um, you know, I, I wanted to highlight that right now the blockchain developing world kind of looks like the picture on the right, right? Uh, that individual on the right happens to be a billionaire, and he's wearing a llama unicorn T-shirt with rainbows and aliens. Um, I don't think that that is the future of blockchain development. I think that is uh, uh, someone that's riding the wave of, of Ethereum as a currency uh, and uh, taking advantage of that. Um, blockchain databases, a multitude of available, uh, private, semi-private, and public. Uh, it's most closely aligned to, to JavaScript. So for those organizations that are building out their Fiori development skill sets around HTML5 and JavaScript, I think that you're going to be well positioned as you continue to build out those skill sets internally. Um, we will and do have the ability uh, to uh, – uh, we are currently working on some prototypes right now uh, where um, – Certain blockchain databases have REST JSON interfaces, so we're able to native ABOP to blockchain. Uh, so, uh, so instead of pivoting through a cloud platform or a middleware tool, uh, we're connecting ABOP directly to blockchain databases. Um, ultimately, though, for you all to, to, to begin working on this, um, you need the infrastructure side. Uh, a majority, uh, uh, every blockchain database that I've installed so far, and I've installed close to six of them, all of them have run on Linux. Uh, all of them are super scalable. All of them can work within a Kubernetes model as well for containerized application deployment. Um, so you're going to need that infrastructure knowledge to kind of support this because uh, unless you're buying databases, uh, blockchain as a service from Microsoft, IBM, Am Amazon, or SAP, you'll need that knowledge. I think as a private blockchain, you'll want that. Uh, you'll need cryptographic knowledge, right, security knowledge in terms of um, uh, understanding uh, digital signatures, generating certificates, public and private keys, exchanging certificates securely, certificate management. I think in the SAP world, we, you know, we're very used to um, user ID and password authentication. Uh, very few companies are using certificate-based authentication, even though we know uh, that certificate authentication is, is very secure. And then uh, on the development side, right, uh, you're going to need um, uh, you're going to need uh, uh, the development expertise in order to read, write, and participate in these blockchain databases. 
Closing thoughts, um, I'm hoping that through this webinar everybody that participated now understands that, uh, that blockchain databases are more than cryptocurrencies uh, and fintech, financial technologies. We have blockchain databases that can support a multitude of use cases. Uh, I went through the fishery example before. I've talked about the, the marijuana industry. I talked about uh, the pizza ovens and servicing of assets. And if you think about that, all, all, all assets, whether it's John Deere's tractors or Ford's cars, uh, th there's lots of use cases there for a distributed blockchain database. Uh, but the most important point is, is when, as we're looking at this, um, it needs to benefit all parties. Right? I think if you're an organization like Walmart, you can, you can force your hand of your partners and, and require them to participate in, in a blockchain uh, technology. Um, but for a majority of the organizations that have joined this call and, and a majority of us nimble customers, uh, you know, it's going to need to make sense to all parties and there's going to need to be buy-in uh, because there is a cost to operating and running a blockchain environment. Um, I also wanted everybody to take away the last bullet there, which is, you know, private blockchains can be permissioned and segmented, right? You can, just because you write something to a blockchain does not mean everybody can see it. Vendors, partners, customers can have different permissions and can be segmented within the distributed blockchain database, enabling you as, a, as the customer, the operator of the blockchain, or, or the centralized authority within the blockchain to communicate to all parties and, and having a, a, a sh and being able to determine the shared communication available uh, between, uh, let's say, your service providers and your customers, or between your subcontract manufacturers and your third-party logistic providers. Um, I think uh, the, the article from Burned in the beginning that I referenced in talking about machine data being shared uh, throughout the supply chain is going to be super relevant in, in, in the future, and distributed blockchain is, is one way uh, that we're going to do that. We wanted to highlight, uh, we'll be in the great city of Boston, November 8th and 9th at the uh, uh, Blockchain Conference for Business and IT Leaders. Uh, we, I, I know of right now two speakers uh, related to SAP at that conference. It is a, it's going to be a great event. Uh, Nimble will be there. We will be uh, live, uh, live demonstrating integration between SAP Cloud Platform and Blockchain. At that event, uh, we will have more content on actually building applications uh, for there. Uh, we have pasted the, the conference link uh, in the chat window should you want to register. Overall, the, you know, the, the conference producers here are absolutely fantastic, uh, and the speaker lineup is really good. I'm going as a speaker, uh, but, I'm all, but I'm more so going to, to participate in the community and learn from a lot of very smart people at the event. With that, I would like to transition to uh, uh, questions now within the chat window. All right, so we have the first question. Uh, said, uh, Mike, you stated that you had successfully connected SAP into an Ethereum blockchain. Uh, can you expand on the steps of, uh, that you can take to do the same? Yeah, so I think one of the, one of the well, right now, I mean, Ethereum uh, has a good community. It was very difficult for me to kind of navigate some of the how-to guides. Um, believe it or not, the uh, Quorum, uh, which is a version of Ethereum from J.P. Morgan Chase, has a packaged installer for Linux. And so I used a, a Linux virtual machine on my Windows machine. I uh, stood up a Linux machine. I installed Quorum very quickly. And through the uh, tutorials on J.P. Morgan Chase's website for Quorum, I was able to um, uh, um, model a, a, a smart contract uh, within the database and then use uh, a, a, REST, uh, X, a REST XML call to actually write a brand new contract to the blockchain um, using uh, SAP Cloud Platform integration services. So in that example, that would be very tough, I think, for a beginner because a Nimble pays for a uh, – we pay for a Cloud Platform tenant from SAP for integration services. That's obviously how I'm moving forward. Um, that is not required, though. Um, if you have if you have an ABOP developer available or a develop, uh, someone with development expertise either in JavaScript or or, or ABOP, uh, you could you could connect uh, a, an ABOP system directly to a blockchain database using the same uh, strategy uh, REST XML. Um, but great question. Uh, I think right now Ethereum is it can be installed. Uh, the tutorials are there. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's Quorum database was very easy to understand. They had some great tutorials. So if you're getting started, to me right now that was the easiest one to get started with. 
All right, next question we have is uh, Microsoft Azure blockchain as a service, is it the same Ethereum public blockchain or is it a, a whole new Ethereum based blockchain separate from the public? Um, so Microsoft's uh, ultimately targeting uh, uh, corporations for this, so they, they are allowing you to, to use the Ethereum based blockchain as a private or public database. And so you, you have those options when you subscribe to that service. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, right now I'm not a pro, I don't want to say I'm a product expert on, on all of Microsoft offerings. Um, you know, everything, this, this community or this new community of blockchain is changing so fast uh, right now that, um, you know, uh, month to month uh, uh, information is changing uh, there. So um, I definitely we can connect you with a Microsoft Azure rep. Uh, for 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 blockchain, uh, if you're interested. All right, this one's uh, obviously based on the infographic that you showed. Uh, it, I'm assuming it means can a legal fisherman also get on the blockchain? And ultimately, the answer there would be no, right? They're they're they are not recognized as uh, or they would have to be uh, an agreed upon participant in the private blockchain. And so in that scenario, you know, of traceability of food, I don't think that would be – I mean, that would be what, would, what we would call a semi-private blockchain. It wouldn't be a public blockchain where you can anonymously participate. In that scenario, you might have a trade association or, or a regulatory agency sort of overseeing and governing a, a distributed blockchain database, uh, validating, uh, you know, validating the participants, much like you know, Twitter validates that I'm Michael Pytel and I get the little check mark. So um, good question, good question. And I believe our last question is, uh, working at a pharma company, we use SAP to track a drug from inception as it goes through the supply chain until it's finally packaged. If a supply chain map can be created with SAP, what added advantage does integrating blockchain provide? Well, the supply, if, if, if you're only tracking your product within your own, within your own four walls, right, within your own uh, data center and customer network, um, uh, then, then you're right. Um, you're tracking it. Uh, you're, you're, you're tracking that data. You know where it was produced, and you know where it was distributed, where it was sold, and when it was produced in its batch, and all of its identifying information. If you, as an organization, then want to participate, uh, let's say with, uh, uh, let let's say, the pharmaceuticals you you sell to a doctor's office, and you want the doctor to now begin participating in a blockchain to talk about. Uh, how often it's prescribed, what patients it was prescribed to, any side effects that it, that occurred. That's a use case for product feedback uh, related to that. And you may already have those channels created today, but just throwing an idea out there of, of where uh, uh, you know that would be required. Ultimately, the same example though with a regulatory agency. You know, a pharmaceutical company has a product and they distribute it to doctors. They sell it to doctors. Doctors uh, describe it to patients. There might be an FDA might have a regulation to say you must all participate in this blockchain database so that we know who made it, when, how it was distributed, who prescribed it, who consumed it, and it's all part of a centralized FDA you know regulated data uh, blockchain database. We had a couple of the questions pour in. Um, does uh, Leonardo, does SAP Leonardo intend to focus on SAP engineered blockchain implementation on Hyperledger Fabric, or will SAP use a, uh, be working with uh, other platforms? I actually had the opportunity uh, yesterday, uh, serendipitously, to meet the the vice president of Cloud Platform, and it is their goal to create a an environment where you can use SAP's blockchain database as a service or leverage any number of the publicly available uh, blockchain databases. So SAP has not said that you will only be able to integrate with theirs. Uh, if you want to participate in Azure uh, or IBM Bluemix or AWS or bring your own uh, blockchain database, SAP will support that. I think SAP has done a very good job in this, in this instance of Cloud Platform of maintaining openness. Um, uh, Leonardo has its own machine learning. Uh, SAP uh, yesterday in a public presentation admitted you can, you can, you can leverage any uh, machine learning technologies from any of the other vendors, whether it be Google, Microsoft, or AWS as well. So kudos to SAP for, for keeping the Cloud Platform environment open. In terms of product direction, um, I've signed up for. I've signed up with. Uh, if you go to Leonardo uh, uh, SAP Cloud Platform's website, click on Leonardo, click on Databases as a Service, the Blockchain Databases as a Service. Right now, there's currently only a sign-up link to participate in SAP's blockchain sort of beta program. Uh, there is no SAP help. There is no way for you to sign up for a trial. So it's still SAP definitely is still in its infancy uh, with respect to blockchain.
All right, next question is, other than guarding against an outage, what value does blockchain provide to EDI transactions? Well, I think the, just, uh, the fact that it's just – so you, you talked about um, outage, right? So distributed, distributed transactions, enabling business partners to communicate to each other rather than pivoting through us. Uh, that's one. Um, ideally, uh, it, you know, in an ideal world, onboarding and offboarding partners in a distributed blockchain database will be easier than onboarding and offboarding uh, partners in, from an EDI perspective with an SAP PI and PO. Um, that's, that's, a, that's another one. Ultimately, uh, if you look at your SAP PI and PO environment, um, you know, uh, we all have services exposed outside our firewall. Um, how easily could someone spoof a transaction, right, um, uh, from uh, externally into your SAP PI environment? I don't know if any SAP customer has experienced that yet. Um, you know, if we're, if we're using user and pass-based transactions, um, is that a potential? Could someone potentially spoof? Uh, an EDI document coming to you, whereas uh, if we're using a blockchain database, all participants in the blockchain are authenticated and permissioned, and every transaction is validated against multiple hosts. So one could uh, theorize that the transaction within a blockchain database would be more secure than a single point-to-point -point transaction between two parties. Right, and then there was a follow-up question, or just maybe a separate question. Uh, what are some of the parameters or characteristics that I can use to help identify block blockchain use cases? For me, I think the the one of the primary drivers or one of the you know characteristics is wherever you have a use case where speed of information and communication between parties can increase profitability or decrease costs. So in the case of the pizza, uh, the pizza oven example, right, increasing the speed at which Service providers can service pizza ovens and communicate. That is one where uh, you could have a rule within a blockchain database that when uh, a pizza oven sensor reports a, a, a fault, it automatically creates a contract for service so that the blockchain is, is acting on its own and not waiting on Middleby as a central party to first look at the default and then create a contract, right? So that's this whole concept of smart contracts uh, within Ethereum. So allow your, your dealer and service network for your organization uh, to operate independent of you in, within a set of parameters and boundaries, obviously. All right. We're about to wrap it up. Um, I think we have one last question. Not exactly sure on this one. Um, what about communication between blockchain platform providers? Um, I don't, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a lot of the research that I've done over the past, uh, you know, three months on this topic. I have not uh, tried uh, to, to mix blockchain providers. So I can't comment on that. I think that uh, Jake and I have slated another a follow-up blockchain webinar at the end of January uh, as we continue, as Nimble continues down this path. Uh, again, that's, that's our job in the community, right, is to, to, to investigate, to research, to inform our customers. Uh, we're going to continue to do so over the next 90 days in this topic area, and, and we're going to have a follow-up webinar, and uh, that, that's something I'll note down as, a, as something to try. All right, that wraps it up. Uh, I want to say thanks so much, Mike, for the, uh, for the presentation. And thank you for everybody who attended. As you uh, head out, I uh, just want to mention again, everybody's going to get a fully edited copy of the presentation. If you could fill out the comments box, uh, we'd love to hear what you liked, um, what you'd like us to explore in the future. Obviously, we cover a lot of different subjects today. We talked about blockchain, but overall, how you felt about the presentation. Um, and that's pretty much it. Again, thanks, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for uh, who attended. Have yourself a great weekend.